titled Mama's Show Spectacular. When I pulled into the old Kiwanis Club parking lot, I was amazed to see the row of cars lining the entirety of the snowbank. I knew my mother took her art seriously, but I was under the impression that she was the only one. Neither of my sisters had flown home for her opening. I had done so simply on account of the fact that I was the family's sole remaining male and still held on to a vestige of that responsibility. My mother talked often of the joy she took from her painting, of how it allowed her to focus on the freedom that our father's desertion had presented her instead of the abandonment, but she never allowed us to view any of her work. I figured it was a phase, something to occupy her like the Pilates classes or the exotic cooking styles that encouraged a pre-meal snack. She was a second grade teacher, and she would always be a second grade teacher. As I now reflect upon this evening, I realize that as I walked into the building, I expected mom's artistic level, as well as her subjects, to be on a plane similar to that of one of her students. Once inside, I passed the placard with my mother's name on it. She had been Mrs. Kinney for so long, and it was refreshing to see her first and original last name declared publicly. I entered the showing room, but instead of searching for my mother or perusing paintings, I scanned the sizable crowd for people who might recognize me. As I said before, my sisters had forced me to confront the ghosts of our childhood on my own. I immediately spotted a number of familiar faces. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Switzer, the school nurse, plucked chocolates off a red cocktail napkin as she bent over to converse with a man in a wheelchair. The Warbies, the town librarians, stood off to the side in their various shades of khaki and whispered to each other in their way that was customary regardless of whether or not they were in the library. The man who ran the farmer's market, whose name I couldn't place, helped his wife with her coat. And when they started for the door, I caught sight of the tall man standing behind them. This particular fellow tilted his head at different angles as he studied the piece before him. He wore black galoshes into which he tucked his pleated corduroys, and I didn't need to look at the blue button down, the green tie resting on the beach ball belly, or the steel rimmed glasses to know that this man was Mr. Crumble, my elementary school music teacher and longtime adversary. Mr. Crumbleman used to have a piano equipped with wheels so he could move him over from classroom to classroom before the music room was built. We could hear the piano's low rumble close in upon us from down the hall, and we groan and begin to look at the clock, urging the music hour to pass with minimal pain. If there was ever a time to feign illness, it was during that hour. Mr. Crumbleman would bark commands at us for several minutes before we were allowed to take out our recorders or our glockenspiels, and if any, at any point our enthusiasm for noise exceeded his level of toleration, he would search the bookshelf behind him for its weightiest volume, normally a dictionary or the P encyclopedia, and slam it down on the piano. He was a wizard of classroom management. My commencement to the ninth grade was a momentous event on account of my enrollment into a new school with a different music teacher and the prospect of finally putting an end to the weekly reports of disreputative behavior that Mr. Crumbleman sent home with me. As I watched him there at the Kiwanis Club, squinting his eyes and extending his hands toward the painting as if to touch it, I felt a queasiness rise in my stomach reminiscent of the episodes I had so often embellished years before. However, I soon forgot his contribution to my nausea when I turned my attention to the wall and the pieces that garnered his intense inspection. The paintings were massive. The smallest was as tall as a ten-year-old, and my mother had shown no restraint with her use of colors or with her application of paint. The reds and yellows and fleshy pinks were caked on with such abundance that many viewers leaned their head against the walls in order to view the pieces in profile, and I was so taken aback by the incorporated style that it was a few moments before I recognized the overriding theme to the show. My mother had entitled it Flourishing, which I suppose had referenced her recent foray into the art world but the pieces themselves were much more singular. Mom had created a collection of vaginas. Tall vaginas, wide vaginas, blue-black 
and brown vaginas, vaginas that reached the ceiling, vaginas that shot out to you in that thick tactile paint. They were everywhere and they were enormous. The room became blurry. I took off my winter hat, hoping the temperature that had so suddenly spiked would recede and that the paintings would somehow morph into something, anything else. It wasn't that my mother knew of and possessed a vagina, but more so that I imagined she had gone to great lengths to study and celebrate her own such organ, the passageway through which I had entered the world, and perhaps the very subject that was depicted over and over and over again on the walls around me. I closed my eyes and started to count. I had just reached five, having attained not an ounce of relaxation, when a familiar voice called out in its soft, familiar caress. I turned around to see my mother smiling at me. She was dressed in a stylish, flowing gown of purple. Her hair was cut short and at a multitude of angles, and by her side she held a man's hand. Her slender fingers were entwined with his bulbous knuckles, and I didn't need to look at the blue cuff to know that that hand belonged to Mr. Crumbleman, who also smiled at me, but in a permanent, a fixed manner that scared me half to death. <laughs> My mother dipped her head ever so slightly, and she said, Say hello to Albert, dear. I had not planned on saying hello to Albert. However, my mother blinked at me with both eyes, pleading. So I turned to Mr. Crumbleman, took a deep breath, and said, Hello, Albert. There was a great deal of banter directed toward me over the next few minutes. I heard nothing. I stared at their locking fingers. My mother's hand had always looked so graceful, youthful even, even uh, as the rest of her grade upon my every visit. They were as tender as the dough they needed, and the resulting bread tasted even sweeter with the knowledge of whose hands had created it. Now her unadorned fingers appeared treacherous while wrapped around their counterparts, and as they maintained their grip, I began to wonder what other evil they had touched. After several minutes of merely nodding my head, I managed to subdue my repulsion. I tried to think if I'd ever seen my mother holding hands with a man. Even when I was very young, before the arguments and the unhappiness and the times when they refused to be present in the same room, I could not remember her holding hands with my father. I couldn't remember her sipping from his glass or brushing the hair from his eyes and certainly not smiling beside him in the way that she was now smiling beside Mr. Crumbleman. For years, my sister and I had agreed that she needed someone in her life, an individual to provide her with intimacy and companionship, and although I would have considered my former music teacher an apocalyptic candidate, I was, despite myself, happy for her. I even felt somewhat responsible for their commingling on account of their former correspondence concerning my dis disreputable behavior. My mother had always commented on the elegance of his penmanship and the sincerity of his tone. She even went as far as to applaud his exemplary commitment to his students. If Mr. Crumbleman was now Albert, I would have to accept him and do my best to banish the images of their intimacies that the paintings on the walls had so acutely embedded in my mind. I returned to the present to find a startling couple standing patiently before me. My mother took a step forward and laid a delicate hand on my cheek. You've come all this way, she said. Honestly, what do you think of the show? I hesitated. I looked around the still substantial crowd, the paintings of the colossal vaginas, my former elementary school nemesis, and then at my mother. She glowed in her long dress and bobbed haircut. I tilted my head to feel the entirety of her palm, and I said, Mama, it's beautiful. It's all so beautiful. All right.